Hey guys, I um, wanted to talk today about uh, potential difference in uh, circuits and Ohm's law and resistors and all that kind of stuff. This is kind of the useful, applicable stuff of electricity that uh, people in electronics, people in, in um, housing and, you know, all the electricity that we use. This is kind of the good stuff here. Um, the theory that we've been doing is really important because it's what makes it work. But, um, and I've actually got a little bit more theory here for you, this first screen. But um, let me define this thing called potential difference. Um, do you remember back when we did work and energy and all that, we had something called potential energy? And if I had, say, a rock here on the ground and I picked that rock up, that would require some work that would be equal to the force times the distance, right? And when I got the rock up here in the air, we said that it had something called potential energy that was a function of its position, mgh. Uh, mg would be the force that I used to lift it up there. h would be the distance. Uh, so there's force times distance. The work has got to be equal to the potential energy of that rock up in the air. Well, this is the same kind of thing. We're thinking about electrical charges. So if I had a charge right here, we'll make it a positive charge like that. And then let's say that I'm, um, I've got this other charge right here. I'll just put Q. Okay. And I am putting a force on this thing and moving it towards this guy. Now, it doesn't want to go that way because this is positive and that's positive. There's going to be a repulsion there. But if I put force and move it over this distance, then I have done some work. And uh, anytime I do work, then that's going to get stored as potential energy. And here we refer to it as potential difference. Uh, once I get the charge over here, if I take my finger off of it for a second, it's going to release that way. It's going to fly back to the left. Just like if I turn loose of the rock here, um, it's going to drop. Gravity is going to bring it back down like that. So it's a really similar kind of thing. And um, the potential difference gets measured in volts. So when you look at a battery and it says this is a 9 volt battery, uh, what it's really saying is how much work can I get out of this? How how much do those charges want to push away from each other? Um, a double A battery, for example, is only one and a half volts, whereas a nine volt battery is nine volts. So I get more oomph, more work out of a nine volt battery. Um, the time that it lasts and all that, that's a whole nother issue. So, you know, I'm not saying one will last longer than another. Uh, it depends on what it's hooked up to and how big of a amp hour rating and all that. Um, but the strength of it, if you will, the oomph of it, how much it will push and uh, light up your flashlight or, or run a little fan or whatever it is that you've, you've got your battery hooked up to, your cell phone, um, you know, that's, that's measured in volts here. Um, we've seen this conversion before. A volt is a joule per coulomb. So right there, that is, again, we can get back to, you know, standard metric units. Um, the potential difference, the voltage, is equal to the work divided by the charge. How much work is it going to take me to push this charge up near that one? Uh, the more work it takes and the more charge that I have to begin with, then that's going to determine this potential difference. And so that's, that's kind of uh, what's going on. The reason all that is important is because we're interested in current. We're interested in these charges moving. Um, if I have a flashlight, I guess I'm dating myself here because that's a pretty old looking flashlight, but uh, there are some batteries in here. And uh, so here's the first battery and the second battery. And these things are arranged so that they, uh, they touch each other and make what's called a circuit you got to have a complete circuit. So there are electrons in here. The electrons are charges. They are stored in there. They have been pushed into that battery and they uh, are looking to escape. They want to get away from each other. There's this potential difference. And so the electrons back here on the negative terminal of the battery 
If you give them a wire, give them a passage, they will come like this. Go through the light bulb. Here's the light bulb. They're going to go through the light bulb and back to the positive terminal of the battery right there. Uh, there's a switch right there that kind of controls the whole thing. Let me just draw this wire solid because uh, it probably won't let me do it now. But, uh, yeah, it's just mad at me. Okay, anyway, the switch right there breaks that circuit. Anytime you have this current, you have to have a complete circuit. So, um, I'll just draw another one here. How about that? Here is that wire. The symbol for my battery is a little short line and a long line, like that. And maybe I've got one of them, two of them, three of them is how I drew it in the in the uh, flashlight up there. So I got three batteries. Right here is my light bulb, a crummy light bulb. Okay, and then it comes back around. And right here, I'm going to put a switch like that. And see how it's it's open right now? The electrons can't flow through that entire path, so the light bulb doesn't come on. Um, when I'm ready for my flashlight to come on, then I slide the little switch or push something down or, or whatever. And when I close this circuit right here, then... I really wish it didn't do that. Um, then there is a complete path right there. And the electrons can flow all the way around this thing. And that makes my light come on. They have energy. They have this stored potential energy. They can do some work for me, which could be turn into light. It could be turn into motion. It could be, you know, run a little RC car, power up my cell phone, my, my laptop, whatever. Um, so that's, that's kind of the everyday utility of electricity and, and knowing something about these charges and how they work. But it goes back to that theory because here's an electron, yikes, here's an electron right here, and here's an electron right here. I've got all these electrons stored up in the battery, and they don't like each other, and they will push each other, you know, right? With, with Coulomb's uh, law. And this guy is going to try to run away, even if it means he has to turn into light, or he doesn't turn into light. Uh, what he does is he makes the filament so hot. There's a little wire right there. And uh, that filament gets so hot that it glows and gives off light. Okay. So it doesn't, the electron doesn't turn into light. It generates light by, by making the wire hot. Um, anyway, uh, that's, that's why we did all that, that uh, Coulomb law stuff and whatever. Because that force is what pushes the electron and makes electricity work. Uh, when you switch on the light switch at your house, right, um, the electricity is going to go up to the light on the ceiling, we'll say, or ceiling fan, or whatever you have up there. I'll just draw a little thing like that. And then it goes back to the power box. So here's all your breakers. And one of those is there. Um, that electricity from the from the uh, power box came over into this side. So again, it's like a little switch, and I'm interrupting that right there. When I close the switch down, then then my my light will come on up here. Okay, we call that flow of electrons current. The current is how much charge is flowing per second. We measure it in something called an ampere, which we shorten down to amps and abbreviate it A. And one amp is one coulomb per second. Now remember a coulomb was a whole lot of charge. So uh, when you go look at a table saw and it says it's 11 amps, that's 11 coulombs every second flowing through the coils of the, uh, of the motor. In the in the table saw, that's a lot of current. All right. Anyway, uh, that's the first kind of thing there. This little formula is handy. Says the same thing we just said, uh, but the I, the current, and that is the symbol we use there, uh, is equal to Q, how much charge divided by how much time, 
You can see that matches my units. I should have coulombs for the charge and seconds for time. So a coulomb per second is this formula, and we call that one amp of current. All right. Next up, I need to talk real quick about the direction that this current flows. Uh, we said that it's principally these electrons that move, and the electrons are negative. And so when I look at a battery, and here's that symbol of a battery again. Remember, I've got a long uh, line and a short line. The long line is always the positive terminal of the battery, and the short line is always the negative terminal of the battery. Uh, that might seem like a weird symbol for a battery, but a long time ago, like in the 1800s, uh, maybe even a little bit before that, um, they figured out, maybe way farther than that actually, but uh, that's another debate. They figured out that if you took different metals and stacked them up like this and put them in a, some kind of electrolyte, like an acid or a base or something like that, that you could hook up all these, um, let's say you've got lead and tin or something here, you know, two different metals, um, that you could get a voltage off of that. And that's still how we make batteries today. So rather than draw all of these, they just said, well, shoot, let's just take one long one, one short one. Okay, and that's the symbol that we typically use for a battery. Uh, you can see here that they've labeled this one as the voltage is 12 volts. So I've got 12 volts of electricity there. This is the negative terminal of the battery. And electrons are repelled from that negative terminal, so they're going to get pushed around this way, trying to get back to the positive terminal. They are repelled by the negative terminal. They are attracted to the positive terminal. Now, unfortunately, back before we knew what electrons were and what neutrons and protons, you know, may be like Benjamin Franklin's day, they knew there was negative charge and positive charge. And uh, somebody said, well, I can see that the current is flowing. I wonder which way it flows. And they just took a guess. And they said, um, I bet that the current goes from positive to negative. Goes around this way. And everybody got together and said, okay, we'll call it that way. All right. What's really happening is electrons are flowing the opposite direction, but we still define current to flow from positive to negative, even though it's really electrons flowing from negative to positive. All right, you just got to deal with it. Mr. Electron here says, I'm going this way, but uh, for us, current passes the other way. That's a little bit confusing. Just accept it and move on. It's not that big of a deal. All right. Um, there are some different kinds of materials, and electrons will flow through some of them very easily. Uh, we call those conductors. Uh, there are some that um, electrons won't flow through at all, and we call those insulators. And there are some materials that, uh, that electrons will flow through with a little bit of difficulty. It has some resistance, so we call those resistors. Now, those are the three important ones that we're going to be talking about. You probably should know that there are also things called semiconductors. Um, we can control that and make it either an insulator or a conductor at will. So all the computer chips in the world, all the cell phones, all the iPads, all the, you know, every kind of digital um, control circuit, is going to be a semiconductor device. Those are interesting. That's part of physics. It's not part of our physics, though, so I'll just kind of let you in that that's there. You're welcome to go look up semiconductors. Uh, lots of fascinating stuff there. Uh, superconductor is another class of material, and um, it's a material that carries current effortlessly with no loss. Um, up here, um, it, with the conductors, uh, when you think about a conductor, copper comes to mind because we tend to make wire out of copper. All right. If you went and got a piece of wire and you stripped off the insulation, the plastic that's on the outside, uh, we put the plastic on the outside to keep the electricity in the wire. If, if, if I grab a power cord, I don't want to get shocked every time. And I would if the insulation wasn't there. The insulator won't let that electricity pass through 
and it surrounds the conductor so that you know the conductor is carrying all the electrons and they're not getting on my hand all right uh, glass is another insulator uh, ceramic uh, rubber all sorts of things here um, different materials have different properties copper carries electricity very well gold carries electricity very well um, and so those are you know often used for conductors aluminum does kind of um, back in the 70s everybody thought they were so smart and they said hey we could put aluminum wire in the houses save a bunch of money save a bunch of weight and uh, it kind of sort of worked um, aluminum isn't uh, it kind of breaks down over time and um, especially right where it's connected to the to the outlets and the switches and there were a whole bunch of house fires and stuff um, but that's another story uh, semiconductors superconductors uh, the only thing I'll say here about superconductors is that you usually have to get them very cold and uh, by very cold uh, very cold temperature um, you know we might be talking negative 60 degrees Celsius or something like that maybe even colder than that it depends on the material um, but uh, those are interesting materials, uh, interesting things that they do with superconductor uh, coils for train levitation, you know, the floating trains and the, all sorts of things get uh, done that way. But that's, that's not our, our problem. Uh, we are interested in the conductors and the insulators and the resistors right there. Um, copper, of course, would, would have some resistance. So it could, it is a conductor, but there is some resistance to it. Everything's going to have a little bit of resistance, except for the superconductors. Uh, and that's kind of a weird case anyway. Let me show you here. Um, these little things that you see in the picture are called resistors. Um, if you've ever opened up any kind of electrical device, uh, you've seen some of these little things. Uh, it's a wire. And then a little piece of ceramic typically here or foil um, and then another wire coming out the other side so I could hook this up in my circuit I could have a battery and I could hook that to the resistor here and then bring this back around to the other side of the battery and the battery would make current flow remember current goes from positive and the current would flow through that resistor. It doesn't really want to go through the resistor, but it really does want to get to the other side. So it's willing to do the resistor. Now, in a broader sense, anything that uses electricity uh, could be considered a, uh, a resistor. Uh, if I put a motor in my circuit, that's, that's causing a voltage drop. That's using electricity. If I put a light bulb, if I put a radio, if I put uh, any kind of thing that we plug in, a refrigerator, whatever, um, all of those could be considered resistors because they resist the flow of electricity and they, uh, they consume that energy that is stored in the battery or, or in the wall socket. All right. We measure resistance in ohms. Uh, this is the Greek letter omega, which omega, ohm, get it? Um, one ohm is equal to one volt per amp. I'll show you more about that in just a second. And a resistor is any device that has resistance. Could be, you know, one of these things. It could be one of these things. Um, we measure the resistance. Uh, you can do it with a with a multimeter, a little box that uh, we would actually be doing uh, in lab if we were doing that. And um, I could hand you a resistor, and uh, like you see, it's got um, kind of this ceramic part in the middle, kind of like a Kind of like a corn dog with two sticks, right? Like that. And then there's some color codes on here. In the example, there's a red stripe and a yellow stripe and a blue stripe. So let me see if I can get enough colors to do that. I already got blue, so I'm going to put a blue stripe right there. And I need a red and a yellow. Here is my red. And here's my yellow. Okay. So I might pick up a resistor that looks like that and the yellow didn't show up very well but uh that's life 
Now, very often there's another stripe over here that we call gold. I'm going to pick this orange because that might be the goldest looking thing I got. Okay. Usually there's four stripes. When you look at these right there, right, one, two, three, four, and the gold is on the left. So that's the way you want to line it up like that. I've got a red, yellow, blue resistor, and that those colors match up with the color code. So all I have to do is come down here, and uh, I see that red is a 2. I see that yellow is a 4. And blue, down here, is a 6. So I got a 2 and a 4 and a 6. Uh, what you do with those numbers is you take the first two of them, the 2 and the 4, and you put them right here. So that would make 24. And then the last one is the 10 to the 6 right there. That would be 24 times 10 to the 6 ohms, or 24 million ohms in that thing. And that's, that's a pretty good amount of resistance. Um, resistors that you see could go anywhere from, you know, 10 ohms or 100 ohms, 150 ohms, 1,000 ohms, 15,000 ohms, 24 million ohms. Okay, you can buy whatever you want, and uh, they're not expensive. Uh, unfortunately, it's kind of hard to buy them anymore because Radio Shack's all closed down. But you can certainly order them on uh, online and um, go to Electronic Parts Place and They'll, they'll be glad to sell you a whole bag of them for a couple bucks. Um, but that's that's how to read the resistor code. It's kind of nice because the, the color band goes all the way around. Whichever way you solder it in, you can still see the color. Uh, you always keep the gold on the left, and the gold is a special stripe. There's kind of three choices there. Uh, there's a gold and a silver, and sometimes there's nothing. Okay. So a gold is what we call a 5% resistor, and a silver, oh man, I think it's a 10% resistor. You almost never see these. I think nothing is a 20% resistor. Uh, what that means is it should be within 5% of what it says on the resistor, or 10% or 20%. And, um, but about all you ever see is gold. There are different ways of marking resistors, but this is the most common. And uh, so we'll just leave it at that, all right? Um, you need to know this little, I'll, I'll give you the colors on the uh, on the test or the lops or whatever you have. But uh, check out what they've done here. Here in the middle, I've got red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. That's the colors of the rainbow, right? There's Roy G. Biv. Left out indigo, but, uh, right? So you've got the colors of the rainbow there. And on one side, you've got black and brown. And on the other side, you've got gray and white. So it's really not that hard to... Uh, to remember this thing. Um, there are little mnemonic devices, little sayings that people use uh, to remember this. Uh, the most famous of them comes from the uh, Navy, but uh, you won't hear it from my lips because it's from the Navy. So here's a, a, an alternative one that you can use. Uh, black, beautiful roses. Occupy your garden. But violets grow wild. All right, and you can see what they've done. They've just picked the uh, oops, picked the uh, first letter of each color, and then picked a word that uh, has that same thing. So you can kind of, right? Uh, if you see a red, then you match that up with roses, and you kind of count down and go, oh yeah, that's two. All right, so you learn the order of these things, and then it's just zero, one, two, three, four, and all the way down to nine. Um, and, and that'll help you keep keep them in order. All right. But I'll give you that on the test and stuff. Okay. Again, this, these resistors control the direction of electricity. They can use up a little bit of electricity to tame it down so that I, I get what I want. Uh, if I'm hooking up an LED, for example, I need to control, I need to get the, the current right so that uh, I don't burn up my LED. And that's actually what, what turns it on and off, is how much current's going through it, not the voltage. And, uh, and, and so maybe I need to put a resistor in there to get the current to where I want it so that my LED comes on. All right. Uh, lots of things for them. Why does the resistor have resistance? 
Well, because different materials have different amounts of resistance. And here's a little table that says if you have aluminum, then the resistivity of aluminum is 2.65 times 10 to the negative 8. And iron has a different resistivity in copper and gold and rubber. Um, you can see here, aluminum has a higher resistivity than copper. So copper is a better conductor. Um, and uh, you can see over here rubber, for example, 1 times 10 to the positive 13. That's a tremendous amount of resistivity. So rub rubber does not conduct well. Uh, this would be an insulator. That's such a high value of resistance. And gold and, and uh, copper and iron and aluminum, those are all decent conductors. Uh, you can see that copper has the least resistance of all those materials so it's really the best wire we could do um, gold is used a lot in stereo applications and computer where uh, you know it has to be right but it's not because it's a better conductor it's because gold doesn't corrode it doesn't tarnish the way that copper does so you know in, in high-end stuff they'll use gold for the conductors or at least the contacts where where wires come together um, but but copper is kind of the standard here. It has the lowest resistance. Uh, it's not nearly as expensive as gold, and uh, it's much more available. And uh, it's a good, you know, it's soft, so you can bend it. It's it's not like iron, or you know, something. So um, that's that. How do you calculate how much resistance there are? Well, I'm glad you asked. If I had a piece of wire that had a certain cross-sectional area here. If I cut the wire, there's going to be a circle right there. And I could uh, find that area either by pi r squared, if I knew the radius, distance from the center to the edge would be r, or I could do pi diameter squared divided by 4. If I just want to measure it all the way across, I could use that number, but I'll have to divide by 4 at the end. Okay, so the area is pretty easy to find of the wire. The length of the wire matters. The longer the wire is, then the more resistance I'm going to have. So here's the, uh, the formula. The resistance of a piece of wire is going to be equal to the resistivity. What material is it made out of and how good of a conductor is that material uh, times the length divided by the area. That's pretty easy. You just jot it down. They'll give you three of the four numbers and you write down, you know, you calculate the fourth one. Um, it's worth mentioning that uh, resistance changes with temperature. So right here is a little formula that says um, if I'm starting off with an original temperature here and I heat that up through some delta T, there's a, a temperature gain here or drop, I guess, but uh, temperature change, let's put that. When I change the temperature, uh, if the temperature change is positive, then that's, this will all be positive, and I multiply this thing that's bigger than 1, and my resistance gets bigger. My final resistance, uh, it's not the original temperature, it's the original resistance, I'm sorry. Uh, the final resistance, if the temperature goes up, is typically going to be larger than the, the original, the initial resistance. Nice little simple easy formula there. Uh, you'd have to have this value of, well it says A, really should say alpha. Okay, uh, this is kind of like a thermal expansion, not quite the same, but we've seen a formula that looked like that before back in the last stuff. Uh, you can see here that aluminum has a, uh, a temperature dependency on, on uh, resistance or, you know, of, of this number in iron and copper. I didn't put the units here. What do you think the units ought to be? I know the final resistance should be in ohms, and the initial resistance would be in ohms. One doesn't have any unit. Right here, the delta T is going to be degrees Celsius, and I need to get rid of those degrees Celsius. No units here. I don't want anything to change here. So all of this needs to have a you know net no um no unit in all this parentheses stuff so if we make alpha one over degree celsius then the degree celsius is going to cancel and i won't have any units here and ohms equals ohms makes sense so that's what i need right here for the 
uh, for the unit on this thing. Every time the temperature goes up one degree Celsius in a piece of aluminum, then the resistance is going to increase by 0 0.0039 ohms. Okay, Iron will go up more. Copper will go up about the same amount. Uh, gold's about the same amount. Okay, I didn't even put rubber because rubber's not really a, uh, you know, the resistance is so high that I don't think it would make any difference with the temperature. That one shouldn't have been on there. All right. Uh, as it gets hotter, you get more resistance. Um, that's kind of important because, you know, when you have a problem with an electrical circuit, um, when it's not doing right, it's going to get hot, and that makes the resistance gets higher, which means that now it's getting hotter because of the resistance, and now that makes the resistance go up, and you know it kind of, kind of spirals right there. But uh, anyway, I got this formula here. This is a big deal. Ohm's law. Uh, this is going to run everything that we need to know about circuits and stuff. This is my favorite way to write it. Uh, the voltage is equal to the current, R I. Uh, times the resistance and it wouldn't hurt to draw a little circuit here remember I've got to have a complete path for this thing so the voltage is implying there's a battery there I've got some wire that is going to take the current around to a resistor so there's my, my uh, circuit and I'll put V for the voltage of the battery. I'll put R for the resistance of the resistor. And then I is going to be the measure of how much current is going to flow through this thing. So it takes off and goes that way. Right there. Okay. And you can see that makes perfect sense, right? If I put a bigger battery right there, that's going to be stronger voltage that's going to push more current right or on the other hand if I put a bigger resistor there that's going to slow down my current or I'd have to put a bigger battery to push the same resistance through a bigger resistor it's all combined right there in that one simple little formula uh, you can write it this way if you want the current is equal to the voltage divided by the resistance um, but uh, it takes more voltage to push current through a higher resistance material uh, more voltage will push more current through the same resistor. All of those relationships are right there in that real simple little thing. I'm going to put some uh, values down for this, and we'll just uh, do one of these here. Let's say that I have a 12-volt uh, battery and a 100-ohm resistor, and I want to know how much current there is. Okay? Well, it's easy. You come in here, and you say, I got 12 volts, and I got 100 ohms, and 12 divided by 100 would be 0.12 amps. Okay? So that would be my, my answer right there. Um, in another circuit. Uh, maybe I want to know how big of a battery I need to put here. Because I figured out that for some reason I need to have 2 amps of current going through a 300 ohm resistor. Okay, how big of a battery do I need? Well, you come in here, the current needs to be 2 amps, resistance needs to be 300 ohms, 2 times 300 is 600, and uh, that voltage is going to end up in volts. Okay, so I need 600 volts of uh, battery there to, to get 2 amps to flow through 300 ohms. Alright, ohms law. It's nice, it's easy, no big deal. Um, what happens if I have more than one resistor at a time? There's two ways to add resistors. We call the first one in series. And um, you can see down here at the bottom that I have um, put uh, one, two, three resistors in a straight line. Here's uh, Mr. Electron complaining because he's got to fight his way through the first resistor. Then he's got to mash his way through the second one. And then finally he's got to deal with the third one here. Um, you can see that he's got to go through 100 ohms. Then he's got to go through 300 ohms. And then he's got to go through 500 ohms. When they are in series, the formula that you want 
to add resistors would be just to add them all. Okay? He's got to fight through one, 300 and 500, a total of 900 ohms of electricity confronts him there. Uh, that's a little bit like, oh man, I had to go through physics one. Oh man, now I got to go through physics two, you know? And, and all those classes that line up like that, you got to, you got to, you know, the total trouble of getting through the whole thing would be just add them all. All right. So that's resistors in series. I also got resistors in parallel. When you have resistors in parallel, there's one here and then one running right beside it. And what's uh, interesting about that is the electron, and remember there's really millions of electrons, billions of them, can either go this way or that way. And that makes it easier for all those electrons to pass. This is kind of a dumb example, but let's pretend there's a big group of people in a room. Maybe a movie theater, right? And a fire breaks out. Um, you got the door at the back. You got the door down at the front. There's got to be two exits at least. Um, those extra exits make it easier for everybody to get out, right? And in the same way here, when I've got two ways to get out, that electron can go this way or the other way. That makes it easier for him to get through. Um, so the total resistance here will always be less than either path. There's a little formula here, and um, I'm going to show you how to do it this way, and then I'm going to show you a quicker, more practical way to do it on your calculator. But just so that you appreciate this, if I wanted the total resistance then what I would do is I would say 1 over 100 ohms plus 1 over 300 ohms. And if I had 3 resistors or 4 or 15 resistors in parallel like you see here, in parallel because here's the first one, right? I'll just draw two parallel lines because it's not going to let me do it over there. Uh, here's a line. There's a parallel line. See how the resistors are in parallel? Um, if I had more if I had, you know, three, four, five of them, I would just keep going with it here. That dot, dot, dot says just keep going. Anyway, I only have two, so I'm, I can stop here. Uh, if you remember anything about adding fractions, you got to get a common denominator, which in this case would be 300. So I need to multiply the first fraction top and bottom by three. And that would look like this. And then I could put these fractions together keep the common denominator and add across the top. 3 plus 1 would be 4. Now that's not my answer. That's 1 over our total. I don't want 1 over our total. I want our total. So I need to invert both sides. If I just flip both sides upside down, then I would have our total equals 300 divided by 4, and that's going to be 75. Half of 300 would be 150, and take half again, you'd be down to 75 ohms would be uh, the answer for that thing right there. Now, uh, most people don't uh, even remember what a fraction is, much less how to add it. So I'm going to show you, you guys do, but you're not most people, right? Down here, what you want to do uh, to do this most easily on your calculator, here's 100 ohms. That's resistor 1. So I'm going to put 100 and hit the inverse button. That flips it upside down like it says to do in the formula. And then I can come along, it says do plus one over the second resistor. So if I go 300 inverse, I can hit enter. And there's that four over 300 in decimal form. And if I invert it one more time, then I get the 75 that we ended up doing it by hand this way. So hit 100 inverse, plus 300 inverse, hit enter so that you get, you know, this number right here. And then you got to remember to invert it one more time. If it's a really small number like 0 0.0133, it's easy to catch it because you go, that doesn't make any sense. Okay. But uh, the answer that you get, 75, should always be smaller than both original resistors. Okay. It is easier for all those resistors to flow through two paths than for them to flow through a single path. 
All right. Now, here's some good fun. Um, I could put a whole bunch of resistors together like this. And uh, what you'd need to do here is to think about this from the, re from the electricity's point of view, from the current's point of view. So I'm going to draw some arrows on here and just kind of think about it. If I were an electron and I were moving this way because there was a battery over here pushing me and I was attracted to the positive uh, terminal, the battery, all that, um, there's that electron. He gets right here. He gets a choice. He can either go up or, or he can uh, go down the other way, right? And um, if he goes this way, see how here's two in series? I know how to add two in series. So I could figure out that bottom path and kind of replace that whole bottom path with a single resistor. If I go through 300 and 500 ohms, that's 800 ohms right here. And just kind of replace that, simplify it, cook it down. So that one's already simplified right there. Uh, if I go on the top path, though, right here, everybody's got to go through this one. But then they get a choice. Here's two in parallel. So what I need to do is to go ahead and combine these two, add these in parallel, and we just did 100 and 300 ohms in parallel. And we saw that that was 75 ohms. And then here again, 130 and 300 would be 75 ohms for this one. So in the first picture, you got all the resistors. And then I took these two and simplified them, cooked it down, and, and made a replacement, a, a uh, something that has an equivalent resistance right there. And this, you know, got replaced with an equivalent resistance right there. Now I've got three in series. Uh, there was this 100. Replace this with 75. This was 75. So those three in series, I could add that. 175 and 75, that would be 150. 250 on the top. We already talked about replacing these and getting the 800 down there. So now I could come in with my calculator. I've got a 250 that's in parallel with 800. And I could go 250 inverse plus 800 inverse is that. I go up. i got to invert it one more time. 190. Uh, looks like it didn't round quite right. But 190, 191, something like that ohms. All right. So again, the, the whole trick is to thinking about it. The way that the current would flow, uh, I'm, I'm approaching this way. I could go this way, and that means that uh, when I come out the other side, I had to go through 800 ohms. And we put that in. If I go on the top, how much is this total path? Uh, i got to put this together first. got to put that together. Then I can think about how much is on that total path. All right. I got a uh, concept here called power. Um, we did power back in uh, physics one. It was how much, uh, how, how fast work gets done. Um, usually back in physics one, anytime we saw the word power, we would write work divided by time. Well, it's exactly the same thing here, um, except that now it's the voltage that's doing work. Um, if you remember, the units way back then were joules per second, and those turned into a watt. Well, that's the same thing we do here. We're still measuring power in watts. It's still a joule per second. And anytime I want to calculate the power, all I got to do is come in here and multiply the uh, current times the voltage. All right, so that's pretty easy. Um, there are some other ways to do it here. Uh, if I take V equals IR, see how there's a V right there? So if I took that IR and I plugged it in right there, then I would get I times IR. And that would be I squared R. All right, so that's a second way to do that. Uh, the other thing I could do is take this right here. And uh, V equals I R. If I solve that for I, that would be V over R. Take that and put it in uh, right here for I. Do one or the other of these. 
uh, that would mean that the power would be equal to v over r times v so that would be v squared over r that would be a another way to do it so you really got three choices here uh, it's current times voltage uh, it's i squared r or it's v squared r v squared over r um, you just kind of got to look and see what you've got all right these these aren't hard to do you know if if they uh, say well the voltage is 110 volts and my current is uh, three amps well then use the one that's got current and voltage right uh, and and so here you'd have three amps times 110 volts and that would be 330 watts um, this watt is the same number that's on top of your light bulb right so a 60 watt light bulb you know we're used to uh, thinking about those uh, it's how fast that light bulb is using electricity or alternatively how fast the power plant has to make electricity in order to run the light bulb and it comes back to the work that had to get done moving that turbine to to generate the electricity all right so that's uh, i think that's the last thing here yeah um so uh good lots of good stuff in there um ohm's law is really important this power thing that's pretty good um but uh, there's a lot of nice things that happen because of electricity, and I hope that, uh, that you kind of now understand some of how that works. Thanks, and have a good day.